Cisco security architecture. So today we're gonna to talk a little bit about the overall Cisco security portfolio and some of the advantages it offers in regards to integration, right? Um, so if you look at the industry as a whole, us as defenders, right? We, we've been trying to bat every threat out of the sky and every security vendor on the planet is trying to provide 100% efficacy when it comes to threats, right? We wanna be able to protect you against everything. And what we found was at this point in time, that's not something that is achievable. You can get very high levels of efficacy, right? And more layers you have, the better chance you have at defending against the adversary. But at the end of the day, there might be a threat that gets in. And, and you're really gonna wish that you had some technologies in place that allow you to be able to respond to that threat while still truly understanding what may have taken place, right? So we wanna be able to quickly scope, contain, and remediate that threat. And I think Cisco's done a really, really good job in giving this to their customers, right? So we wanna bat out as much as we can, right out of the air, right? Threat comes in, bam, done, block, no impact. But when they squeak in, we're gonna give you capabilities that are very difficult when you start looking at some of the fragmentation we see in the security industry as a whole. And if you look at the industry as a whole, you have to ask the question, does legacy approaches to security, right? All these different products and management and, and skill sets all tangled within the environment, has that really worked, right? We believe there's challenges there and, and hence why uh, we've really focused on arch arch architecture and, and, and integration. So let, let, let's start, right? So when we look at this, again, you start with a product, right? You might say, oh, I need a next gen firewall. But if you really focus only on that component, you might be missing the bigger picture, right? There's some advantages, right? They'll have some bells and whistles. We'll have some bells and whistles, right? We can argue efficacy and who's better right? Uh, well, we can discuss context and un truly understanding the threat. But at the end of the day, you're going to look at that product from a point product perspective, you might miss some of the integrated pieces that provide that one plus one equals three. So when we look at security architecture, I'm not going to talk about each one of these technologies in depth. That That's not the goal here. The goal here is to kind of show you how the security technologies come together and some of the information that we're sharing. Again, it's not gonna be comprehensive. I'm not gonna go into everything that we're sharing, but I'm gonna show you why we believe that this solution overall, and it may take time to get there, is valuable to our customers. So we look at ThreatGrid, right? So ThreatGrid is an outside looking in sandbox. Um, every one of our products that have um, an AMP license as it has the ability to send samples to threat grid for analysis, right? So detonate in a sandbox, it's outside looking in, so there's nothing in the virtual execution space to allow malware writers to know they're being monitored. There's all kinds of other things like, you know, uh, having automated clicking of, uh, of dialogue boxes that come up, mouse movement, um, you know, data, within the virtual machine, et cetera, right? But, but the idea here is, is that customers have this capability when they have malware, right? If you have ThreatGrid, the portal, portal access, now you've centralized all your samples. Now this is valuable because they're centralized and they allow your teams to be able to go to one spot to see samples across the entire organization. So we're gonna talk about that. And when Threat grid gets information about something bad. What happens is it pokes what we call is our AMP cloud. And, and once it pokes that AMP cloud with that new information, this will disseminate to uh, the, uh, the products within the portfolio. And we'll show you that in a second. So, so as we go along, this could be on-prem uh, email security, might be cloud, right? Either or, it doesn't really matter. I, I know I put cloud here, but the samples again come in through an attachment and then we have the ability to send that to that sandbox centralizing that that sample right and then you get a disposition back when we look at cloud lock so this is an api driven casb right the idea here is is that it extends 
capabilities that proxies are, aren't able to do, right? So API, it's more rich, better uh, capabilities with integrating with those cloud-based applications. But what we've done, which is really cool around things like Shadow IT, is integrated that with Umbrella. So now you have the ability to sanction, when you have a sanctioned application, you may not want people to use other applications. So for example, if you have OneDrive and it's sanctioned app, you want people to use that. You don't necessarily want them to go and start leveraging, you know, Dropbox or other uh, file repositories, right? Because you're trying to control where that data is going, right? And you control that um, that software, right? So you know where the data is going. You uh, have the ability to, that if somebody leaves the organization to retain that data, etc. So what we're able to do is within CloudLock or Umbrella for that matter is be able to say that I don't want you to go to some of these other applications, right? So I don't sanction this app. I'm going to block that app. What's really key here is that it's both on and off prem. So that means that that control, which has been a big problem in the past, that control only exists when you're on premise, right? Behind the big perimeter, right? Fortified, you're battling, you know, the war and, and you might be almost winning. But the moment that asset moves off the network, you've just allowed it unfettered access in, the most, in most cases to the wild, right? You might have AV, right? So, so Umbrella extends that. Now I'm being able to move that control with that user and that device no matter where they go. So that's pretty interesting. The other thing that we do is now we have intelligence around the samples and how they might be tied to the domains themselves. So, you know, the domain without a sample may be benign, right? There's nothing else maybe to suggest that it's bad. Maybe the indication of bad is that a sample is there. So we have the ability to tie that into to, to threat grader, right, in that database of information. So that, that's pretty cool. Firepower, now we get into next-gen firewall, right? So the ability, again, to send that sandbox, or sorry, that sample uh, to threat grid. Again, now it's centralized. We we have that ability if you, you need dedicated web proxy, whether this is in the cloud um, or on-premise, you have the ability as well to send that file to threat grid for sandboxing again centralizing the files now we have ice right so this is network admission control right being it with a threat centric focus meaning that i can take really cool information around vulnerabilities uh other disposition changes of assets and make decisions and there's a bunch of other integration pieces that i'll, that I'll talk about and then you also have stealth watch right use the network right the network provides a tremendous amount of intelligence. Now we can feed that into a platform and do some behavioral analytics and, and understand what the, the environment looks like normally. And when it changes from that normal behavior, like an SMB 445 probe, that's now moving laterally within the environment, I can now get an alert. And based on that alert, I can do things, right? But at least now I have visibility, both north, south, east, west. Then you have, Endpoint AMP. So Endpoint AMP from Cisco allows you to run antivirus and endpoint detection response as a single client, right? And um, there's some customers that may have an AV product that exists today with other things that they're doing, and they might leverage us for endpoint detection response, more of the advanced threat side of the, the, the equation. But the idea here is that you could displace and use it as pure play AV with endpoint detection response. What's key here, though, in this particular discussion is that sandboxing, again, is available and it's both on and off prem. So, again, I'm now getting visibility regardless, right? If I want to send a sample up and the assets off prem, I have the ability to do that. Then we have cognitive. So cognitive uh, threat analytics is, is really, really cool. So it finds malicious activity that is bypassed that that internally might have bypassed the controls that you have in place. Um, so it, it does things like unmonitored channels, including things like removable media, right? Somebody plugs something in and out and then they execute it. It might make a call that doesn't trigger uh, an event internally, but with additional analysis, um, you may find that there, this is a, 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 has malicious intent. 
So cognitive threat analytics is cloud-based, right? A product that uses machine learning and statistical modeling for networks, right? But it also allows us to feed in proxy logs, right? So it helps discover things like command and control, data exfiltration, um, DGAs, right? Communication to those, uh, tunneling through HTTPS, potentially unwanted uh, applications. It's also part of our encrypted traffic analytics, right? To help make sense of um, malware that might be running in your network uh, using in encrypted channels. So it, there's a tremendous amount of value in that. So what we do is we can send flow data to that back end, right? For supervised machine learning. Um, and that's based on flow, but we also get to do that with proxy logs. Uh, and then what that allows us to do is um, obviously find that threat uh, that uh, might be a little more buried um, and, and give you insight into that so we can do something about it. But it also allows us to um, add to that five tuple. So if you look at Stealth Watch, it's based on flow, right? NetFlow, JFlow, etc., cetera, IP fix. And that's five tup based on five tuple, right? Source, destination, IP, source, destination, port, and protocol. That's good information. But imagine now st stitching in something like the URI. So now I know the URI that the individual went to. And we'll expand on that in a second. The other really neat thing is that we can feed that information that we're learning from proxy and, and flow um, into our endpoint AMP console. And now you have additional intelligence to suggest that and, and you can pivot back and forth. So the one thing to note here is AMP cloud lookup takes place. I'm not doing this in, in regards to order of execution. I'm just trying to lay the, the or provide a, you know deep insight into some of the integration points. But you have to remember before sandboxing takes place, all of these products do a quick cloud lookup, right? So they take a SHA-256, for example, they send it to the AMP cloud, they get a disposition back. Um, and that's very quick, right? And, and we're gonna block a lot of threats that way. It, the sandboxing provides that ability to do things that are unknown, right? And visibility into that unknown. So, so we have AnyConnect, right? So that's another part of the equation and we get network visibility module. That's what NVM stands for. We got 802.1x, right? VPN, uh, you can integrate Umbrella into AnyConnect as well. So that's pretty cool, but what can you do with it, right? So you can do things like 802.1x and VPN. On the ICE side, if you look um, over here, we have posture profiling, Mac, uh, Mac authentication bypass, you know, you can do guest, et cetera, right? Um, so, but we can posture and profile, get really good context in, in regards to the disposition of the, the asset overall, right? How healthy is that asset to be suitable to connect to my network? The other thing that we can do with the network visibility module is device type, Mac and user, as well as process. Now the process piece is really cool because imagine being able to really understand what made the connection outbound to that from that asset. So if a, a user is on premise connected to the network and there's a PowerShell execution using NT authority subsystem to make an outbound call to a known bad IP address, you might want to know whether that user actually executed the uh, Firefox and typed in a URL and went there, or maybe an underlying process was invoked uh, that, that did that. Um, what that might allow you to do or, or gives you visibility in understanding that that threat might be due to something that's already resident on the asset, right? Like malware. Um, so it's just better insight. So now you have the five tuple, right? So source, destination, IP and port and protocol. You now know the device type, it's Windows 10. You know the MAC address of the device. You know the user on the machine and you know what processes were invoked and which user invoked that process to make that, that connection. And you have the URI, right? All within one flow record. All that information is there. When you talk incident response, I don't have to go now and go, okay, here's the flow record. Now go to the proxy. What did the proxy do, right? What does the device see? Who did it on the device? Was it the user? Was it a process? Let's scan. I get that all within one flow query and it's there and available for me to make a decision. All right, so everything's 
you know, centered around Talos. So I don't want to lose sight of Talos in, in all of this, right? That that's the big uh, security intelligence arm for for Cisco that that researches, you know, the threats, the actors out there, and makes sense of that and helps build the defensive capabilities within our products, right? So Talos is the wrapper, um, and you'll always hear about Talos with everything that Cisco does from a security perspective. Now, going back to that AnyConnect client, you can also deliver the endpoint AMP agent that way as well. Again, it just simplifies it for you from a deployment perspective. So operationally, there's some advantages. And then it's integrated, right? So the other thing that ThreatGrid, you can see up at the top here. So ThreatGrid also sends sample data to Cognitive for application of machine learning models. Right, the idea around cognitive is the ability to continually train and give it new information so it can build new algorithms, right, to, to identify the threats out there. Again, the more data that we can feed, clean data and threat data, uh, the better the algorithms end up being. So again, ThreatGrid provides uh, some of that uh, to cognitive as well. Now, cognitive isn't a product you purchase. Cognitive comes with um, for example, your uh, web security, if you have uh, the web security appliance, um, you could leverage Cognitive. If you have Stealth Watch, for example, you can leverage uh, Cognitive. And that flow data, like I said earlier, or the, sorry, not the flow data, the Cognitive Intelligence information gets sent back into Endpoint AMP as well. All right. And then we finally have... Um, uh, samples to, tied to domains. I think we already talk, talked about that, but the umbrella value is is that we can extend a lot of that protection mechanisms off prem as well as having it on prem. So we're talking a little bit about retrospection. So retrospection again, I think is a really valuable tool because what happens is this: a file comes in from the internet, right? Goes to your next gen firewall. The next gen firewall does the AMP cloud lookup, does some high fidelity signature checks, all that good stuff, right? And it comes back as unknown. So what happens? That file gets moved into threat grid, right? Based on policy. And that connection continues. Now, before that, if we would have got a, a result as bad, we would have blocked the file, right? You would never have seen the file. When you have to send it to a sandbox, you can't hold that connection open. Remember, it's an HTTP connection. You can't just say, well, wait a minute, I'll be back in seven minutes, right? Or maybe longer, right? Because once you get the disposition of the file through ThreatGrid, it updates the AMP cloud, and the AMP cloud then disseminates that across the entire portfolio. So now it's on the endpoint, right? So it passed here. Now what we do is it went up, we analyzed it. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to have been sent up, right, as an unknown file. This could be intelligence fed in from Talos as a whole that suggests now that that file is associated to bad. Either way, if we get behavioral indicators that suggest bad or not, what we're going to do is we're going to go and systemically send this out to all of the products that support it, and you can see them here, and we're going to actually now block that file. And we call that a retrospective event. Now what's key in this is, is that we also tell you that the file existed in your environment prior to that, meaning that you may have to investigate further, right? Because the user may have executed. I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we do to help with that so you truly understand some of the scope. But the good thing is, is that retrospective event, whether you're on-prem and you have endpoint amp or off-prem, right, and endpoint amp, you're gonna get that quarantine action take place, right? We're gonna start blocking the threat. So that's really cool. So as we move along, we have AMP Unity, right? I'm gonna come back to some of the feed data that we get uh, in regards to retrospection and some of the things that, that are valuable when you tie in endpoint AMP and firepower. But AMP Unity is another really cool uh, capability. So for example, if you see a threat and you analyze, and it, maybe it was blocked as a threat and you guys believe it's clean, and you want to give the business access to it, um, either or, uh, but in most cases, right, you're looking at something and there's behaviors of some sort that no security platform may have discovered, maybe it's unique to your environment, whatever. You make a decision that it's bad. You have the ability to identify that, right click that file and block it. And when you do that, the firepower, threat defense, web security, cloud security are actually endpoint 
they end up being endpoint um, devices within um, endpoint AMP. I now right click and block that so I add it to a blacklist. It's now being blocked not only at the endpoint on and off prem, it's now being blocked at the the egress, right? So firepower, web security, cloud email. Now we're or or on prem email, it doesn't matter. We're now blocking that file from any from coming in. So any of the, the, those files that we ever see again, we're we're going to block them. So again, now you've you've instantly created this layered defense. And again, key in this is that even if you're off-prem, you're now blocking that file based on the decision that you have made. So Cisco Threat Containment. So this is now tying some of this in, in regards to um, how do I respond, right? Now I've got a lot of this cool intelligence being shared, right? I've got retrospective that comes out and blocks. I've got AMP Unity that I can send out and disseminate. Uh, information that uh, I deem as bad and wanting other products uh, it, that are integrated to start blocking. But what about threat containment? So so meaning the threat exists, right? So from StealthWatch, what I can do is um, I have the ability to quarantine and unquarantine. But like I said earlier, things like device type, you know, MAC address, user identity, and then if you have endpoint app, you also get process, is tied in here to help me make that decision. So now what I can do is if, I, if I'm doing analysis within StealthWatch, I can actually click one button to say quarantine that asset. It'll tell ICE about that, that uh, using PX Grid, and then it'll uh, remediate that device, right? So it'll you know maybe shut down the port or move it into a quarantine VLAN, et cetera. Um, that's pretty valuable, right? Uh, again, I don't have to go to other teams to figure out what I need to do. I have the power to do that from here. And if I make a mistake, I can unquarantine it as fast as I quarantined it. So that's pretty neat. Endpoint AMP feeds into Identity Ser Services Engine using Sticks Taxi, right? Uh, new information around the disposition of the asset. So for example, you were at Starbucks or any coffee shop for whatever reason, you plug in a USB key or go to a website, you get compromised, right? You come back into the office, um, there's a retrospective event um, that takes place 30 minutes from now, right? But you've already got on the network, you've already pro uh, profiled and postured the device, you've met every requirement that you can impose on a device before you let it on the network. It gets on the network, 30 minutes from now, you determine it's bad based on a retrospective event. So Talos sees something, they update it, that retrospective event goes out. That means the disposition has changed on that asset, right? And it gets fed into ICE, and then ICE says, oh, something's changed with that asset. And based on policy and based on the threat level, I'm now going to move that off into a quarantined VLAN or shut down the port, et cetera, right? From firepower, we can feed bad behavior, right? So for example, an asset's on the network, everything looks good, right? It passed all the checks. None of the security appliances are suggesting that anything is wrong with the device, but it makes a call out to a CNC, uh, some command and control, um, and Firepower sees that, and Firepower blocks it, fantastic. But you may not want that asset to be on the network because something else might be taking place, right? So what happens is you can have Firepower send information to Identity Services Engine and again, remove that asset from the network. Pretty powerful, right? And that could be two in the morning, right? Or your printer's just all of a sudden starting to reach out to something bad, right? Um, maybe you shouldn't allow the printer to go outbound, but you know how some environments are. It happens. Now I can take action against that printer. At, again, at two in the morning, everyone gets the alert. They know it's been quarantined. They can deal with it in the morning, right? The threat has been mitigated. Now, I talked about retrospection. Now, retrospection is the ability to uh, understand that a file's um, disposition has changed from the original, um, the original um, status that we gave the file. So it could be a clean file, now bad, right? It could be an unknown file, now bad, right? Um, that disposition has changed. So I talked about Firepower. You've got 500 devices that seen this file. Okay, and in Firepower, you're gonna see retrospective event. It's gonna tell you, here's a retrospective event, 
And then you're going to have a list of maybe 500 users that actually went to that uh, and pulled that payload. Now, as an analyst, wouldn't it be valuable to know out of those 500 whether or not it's been quarantined? So that, that's the first thing, right? I want to know, is it quarantine? Is the threat actually mitigated? Because now I know it's on 500 machines. So Endpoint AMP will feed that information back into Firepower so you can see it right in the interface. It's been quarantined on the endpoint. Valuable, right? But what's even more valuable to that, wouldn't it be nice to know out of those 500, which ones I need to attend to? So quarantine's the only start of it, right? You've got to remember it's a retrospective event. So it happened previously, meaning that there's a potential that that, that asset was compromised and maybe intellectual property was being exfiltrated through the environment or even worse externally, right? Here nor there, wouldn't it be nice to know whether or not out of those 500, which one I need to focus on. So what you'll do today is that now you have 500, what you'll probably do is you'll go up into your other tools and start researching to find out whether or not um, the endpoint um, did certain things, right? But wouldn't it be nice to know whether or not the malware was executed in the first place? So imagine this, I go to the, I get the file, it's in the download directory, maybe I went to a link, everybody went there for whatever reason, it downloaded, and I never executed the payload. That payload is actually sitting in the download directory. So we'll actually send that information back up to Firepower to say, was malware executed? Yes, no, right? So now maybe 495, nobody executed the payload, it's in the download directory, and it's quarantined. Five machines though, Although it's quarantined, executed the payload. I need to do additional analysis on that asset. And that's where I can start leveraging some of the tools we're gonna to talk about today, right? But I can also go to Endpoint AMP and start doing you know, device trajectory to find out everything that that file may have done on the asset. But now I know I need to focus on five, not 500, right? Again, uh, this is gonna help you move uh, you know, from that very high critical state into you know it's it's uh, at least uh, manageable um, that you guys can start your investigations. It's very focused. Um, you've got a lot of the data that you need to make decisions. So that that's going to really really help. The other thing that it does is it, it can also send applications that are introducing IOCs. So if you have an application that might have a vulnerability right out there, and, and Endpoint AMP can help with stuff like that, but it has a vulnerability and it's being exposed. Wouldn't it be nice to know that that application has been in introducing IOCs, right? And then you can make a decision whether you want to you know, block that application on Firepower, or extend that blacklist to the endpoint, et cetera. So that's threat containment, right? Just to give you an idea. Now, when we talk about Cisco's threat response. Now this tool is, I, I think, is really, really valuable because two reasons. One is it's gonna help with incident response. It's also gonna allow you to respond. So not only investigate the issue, but actually respond from a central interface. And if you have Threat Grid or Endpoint AMP, or even better both, um, you have access to that tool. And what I'll do is I'll put the link to the tool in the notes on the on the YouTube channel, but um, but now you have access to this tool. So what does this tool give you, right? So we know bad will happen at some point. So Cisco Threat Response is going to enable you to investigate those attacks and respond quickly, easily, and more importantly, confidently, right? Truly understanding the scope of, of that uh, breach. So Cisco Threat Response simplifies security investigations and incident response. Um, it allows you to aggregate threat intelligence, more importantly, enrich that intelligence with context from the organization. Um, and then ultimately, it shows you where you're infected, right? And I think that's the biggest thing. And, and, and what's really cool is, is that not only is it using information that's tied to your organization and you can go to grab uh, information from Talos and the latest blog and you can throw it in there and it's going to tell you everything that your network has seen in regards to that threat. But you can take an IP uh, a domain, uh, SHA-256, or a collection, or a whole bunch of stuff. You can actually go to a, anybody's blog and just do a Control-A, Control-C, right? So you copy everything on that page, 
everything. You don't need to go and parse out the IPs, etc. You just do control A, control C, and go and do a Cisco threat response and paste it in there and it'll go and it'll let you know what it sees, right? And anything that's related in your environment that might be talking to any one of those observables or indicators, right? So it's a pretty powerful tool and today uh, there's three areas that you can leverage it, right? You do need Threat Grid or Endpoint AMP or both. Um, but you can investigate and respond from Endpoint AMP. You can investigate from for, from Threat Grid, and you can investigate and respond um, in regards to Umbrella. Right? Certain licenses are required in Umbrella, but 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 that's the idea. And again, I show these tied to each product, but it's actually one interface. Right? You you don't go to each one of these products and log in. You log into one central um, interface. And what's coming is we're extending this to investigate and respond on firepower, web security, and email security as well, right? And you know we'll continue to, to grow this out. So let's go through an example. So today a file uh, comes in, uh, you're doing your analysis in the tool. So you're in Cisco's threat response tool. And you deem that there's something in the organization that you got intelligence on that maybe we're not blocking, right? So if we're blocking it, most likely you're already gonna see that block action take place. But you've done additional investigations, whether this is through your own intelligence, right? Or it's substituted with other intelligence, regardless, you deem it as bad. So now what do you do, right? As an analyst, what do you do to respond to that? Right, so you might feed this into your passive defenses like firepower, web security, cloud email security, endpoint. Right, you want to feed that information into it, and you might have to hit every one of those interfaces to do that. Wouldn't it be nice if I go, Well, wait a minute, that file is bad. Let me add that to a SHA 256 custom detection list, in this case called malware. I'll add it to it, and I go back now to AMP Unity. Remember what happens when we blacklist that file and we have AMP Unity that now I block it on the endpoint, I block it in firepower, web security, cloud email security, right? That's where things are, right? Like now you're able to systemically take action against a potential threat in a timely fashion to, to help mitigate the overall threat to the organization. And remember that when I took that action, that endpoint, even if it was outside of the organization, as long as it's connected to the internet, you would have got that update as well. Now, you know, our endpoint product has an on-prem option and cloud option. Most people do leverage cloud, but there's some times that you might need a um, on-premise option, right? Because the, the devices that you're securing uh, will never or you never want to talk to the internet whatsoever, even to get updates. So there's, um, you know, cloud proxy mode or completely uh, air gap modes, right? But for the most part, many people will use the cloud option because the value or a combination of both, to be honest, but the, the, the value of it is, is that as those assets are coming in and out of the network, I still have the ability to start mitigating risk. All right, so now we look at a domain. So we're in Cisco Threat Response Tool, and we happen to now look at a domain that happens to uh, be interesting. In this case, it's malicious. Um, but it could, again, be something that... Um, we've got from our own internal uh, intelligence or ex external intelligence and we're investigating it and we again now deem this as bad so uh, maybe we're seeing our assets talk to it right so what i might want to do now is block that domain and when i do that right from this interface i don't have to give the analyst access to all the 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 devices that are securing the organization i can just give them access to cisco threat response, right? That API driven capability will actually go out and update that block list to Umbrella. Now, what's cool in this again is not only am I protecting on-prem assets, I am now pro protecting those external assets from getting compromised, right? So again, it's very quick click. And again, I'm not talking about the other things. You can do investigative stuff here where you can go browse that URL or that SHA-256 in ThreatGrid. You can look at Talos Intelligence to see what we're saying about it. 
Um, you can also go and look for that URL on endpoints or SHA-256, right? So there's there's other capabilities for to, to help enrich that investigate an investigative portion of your role as needed. And then you're going to pivot from there into some more specific tool sets, right? So for example, if I wanted to know what threat grid was really seeing in regards to that URL or uh, that SHA, I'm going to go into threat grid from that interface, right? So when I click browse, it's going to open up threat grid, right? Authenticate, right? And now I'm in and I'm looking at it. Or if you've already authenticated, you're in, right? Okay, so it doesn't stop there. This is the final piece, right? So um, Casebooks is, uh, again, API driven. But what it does is it allows other applications to provide UI components for submitting observables directly into Cisco Threat Response. So this allows for uh, immediate reputation lookups without ever leaving the host applications interface. So that's pretty cool, right? So I can drive these case books and I can feed it in uh, information in regards to um, gathering observables, right? And then I can put them into these groups or cases where other people can also view and add additional observables into it as well that, that are part of the overall puzzle. I can add notes, I give it a case name. Um, it, it allow your teams to work together um, where uh, it otherwise uh, it might be a little bit more fragmented, right? They can real time add information within that case book and it's being shared across um, all the, the technologies that, that are in place. So casebooks are available with, with Endpoint Amp today. It's available with ThreatGrid. Um, and then we're going to continue to add capabilities, or Cisco is going to continue to add capabilities across the rest of the stack, right? Firepower, NextGen, Firewall. You'll have web security and email security all having a capability here when it comes to casebooks. So the idea is, is to prevent 100% of everything, right? That's the goal of every security vendor out there. The reality is though, you're not able to do it 100% of the time. So tools like this and capabilities around architecture, integration, and then ultimately the, the ability to respond in a meaningful fashion, right? Time is, is of essence, right? It's how quickly you can respond and, and, and start mitigating the risk. There's a ton more capabilities in that integrated architecture, uh, architectural approach uh, that Cisco offers, um, but that'll be another day. We can dig deeper into that. What I wanted to do today was give you a, a good idea of how some of that technology really has come together. Anyways, good luck on defending. <laughs>